Ten days from now, more than 100,000 supporters of the Ontario Liberal Party will be able to cast votes for a new leader. After two straight, soul-destroying elections, the Liberals feel as if they have some wind in their sails. Thanks to the Greenbelt and other scandals, the Ford Conservatives are on their heels. Who is the best candidate to lead the Liberals out of the wilderness? Let's introduce, in alphabetical order, the four candidates that want the job. Bonnie Crombie, Mayor of Mississauga. Nate Erskine-Smith, MP for Peaches East York. Ted Shu, MPP for Kingston and the Islands. And Yasser Nakfi, MP for Ottawa Centre. And it's great to have you four with us here. I know this has been a really long, arduous campaign and making time in your schedules for our viewers, we're really grateful for. So thank you. I want to start with a really nice, obnoxious question, okay? Let's get right into it here. Your parties had two stinker elections in a row where you didn't even gain official party status in the Ontario legislature. So, and I know I shouldn't be asking this because I actually want people to watch, but really, why should anybody think that you have anything relevant to say right now, given the track record of this party over the last five plus years? Alphabetical order, let's go. Liberals are back. People are really excited about liberalism again. As we all travel across the province, we're drawing large crowds. When I got into this race, I was told count on four or five people in a room. Literally hundreds of people right across the province want to meet us, want to hear what we have to say. Want to... We are reinvigorating our brand. We are building back confidence with voters. And people are proud to say that they, that they are liberals again. I will say yeah. that people stayed home. They were disillusioned. Um, or perhaps they were being pragmatic and voted for another party. Mm -hmm. But I'm quite confident they're cut back and the way they're going to support us in the next election, and we will win in 2026. Nate Erskine-Smith. So here in Ontario, there are many reasons for people to vote against Doug Ford in the next election, but we have to give people a positive reason to vote for us. And it comes down to articulating strong liberal values. I've articulated the need for confidence, compassion, and integrity at Queen's Park. It's about big, serious, credible, ambitious ideas on the challenges that exist in every corner of this province. And ultimately, it is about the hard work of rebuilding relationships and trust, not only here in Toronto, but in Northern Ontario, Southwestern Ontario, and everywhere in between. Ted Shu. The Liberal Party certainly has been reinvigorated by this uh, leadership contest. Uh, we had more votes than the NDP in, in the last election, but I think that the Liberal brand, I think people believe in equality of opportunity and making things better thoughtfully. But the Liberal brand needs a refresh. And what I'm offering is somebody who's different, haven't seen before, uh, to offer a fresh start for the, uh, for the Liberal Party. And I think people see that. Uh, and I, I think the future looks very bright for the, uh, for the Liberal Party. The party's energized because of this leadership race and people are thinking about what the future of this province should be and what the future of this party should be. Yes, sir, Nakvi. Under Doug Ford, people are struggling in this province. Uh, they are struggling to find family doctors or nurses. Kids are struggling in overcrowded classrooms. Young people are working two or three jobs and struggling to pay rent or buy groceries. People are looking at Ontario Liberal Party to come forward with practical solutions to make their lives easier to live. <clears throat> that has always been our, our strongest uh, place, is when we come up with practical solutions. And that's why this leadership race is important. That's why the right leader for the Ontario Liberal Party is so, so important, so that we can defeat Doug Ford in 2026. You've mentioned Doug Ford a couple of times now, and I want to pick up on that, because I, I know this drives Liberals crazy. But Doug Ford does have... He does have a connection with a big enough chunk of the electorate right now. Obviously, he did five and a half years ago, and he did more recently, and has won two consecutive majority governments. And even when he screws up, he goes before the microphones, and he apologizes, and he seems to, after losing support, gain it back. Okay, Nate, you start us off here. What makes you think you can chip away at that bridge of trust, which he has apparently built, to enough of the electorate to win straight, two, two straight elections? Well, let's be honest about the last election. The last election, people said Doug Ford wasn't as bad as we thought he was going to be. And they were looking around, they didn't see a positive alternative that was motivating them to get out and vote as against Doug Ford. And he wasn't Jason Kenney, he wasn't a Republican governor, and they gave him a free pass. And there's going to be no free pass. After the corruption of the Green Belt, you've got people rightly frustrated about lack of access to family doctors and a really frustrating experience in our healthcare system, underinvestment in public education. People are going to want change. We have to offer that change in a really positive way to say, if you want better in politics and we all want better, the answer is participation. People need to see politics as a vehicle to make a difference and they need to see the Liberal Party as a vehicle to make a difference. Would you agree he has somehow established that bridge of trust 
with a big enough chunk of the electorate that it's given him two victories so far. But I think he's he's broken that trust now. I mean, he's been caught uh, no longer being for the people, but for his friends. I mean, the whole Green Bad scandal, he didn't pull out of of the Green Belt giveaway because he realized how important Green Belt is because he got caught with his hand in the, in the cookie jar. The next election, Steve, is going to be fought on trust and ethics. And people are going to be looking forward towards electing a leader who's the most trustworthy, who stands in stark contrast to Doug Ford. And that's why this leadership race within the Ontario Labour Party is really important because we have to elect a leader who stands opposite to Doug Ford and can prosecute Doug Ford on his failing and corrupt government. Are you different enough from him to be the guy? I am definitely different from <laughs> Doug Ford. But to answer your original question, Doug Ford got less than 18% of voters uh, to vote for him. What we have so is... Just a, explain that. He, well, he, he actually got 40 Right, but turnout was so low. Turnout, yes. turnout was so low <clears throat> that the actual number of voters who voted yeah. for him was less than 18% of the total group of voters. Yeah. So we have a turnout problem. Turnout was very low in the last election. And to me, that means we need to inspire people. So we need a leader of the Ontario Liberal Party who knows what they're about, why they're running, and, and can inspire people to get out and vote. And a lot of that has to do with trust. Like People have to trust that it's worth their while to get out of the chair and go and vote, invest that time, and that it will make a difference. So we've got to earn that trust, and I think we can earn trust by many different ways. One is going out and meeting people in person. Another one is putting out policies that have some pushback, but we really believe in them. And apologizing when we're wrong, that's another way to keep any trust that you earn. So I think that uh, we can do that in this party. We're on the way. Doug Ford is very vulnerable when it comes to trust, but we have to be trustworthy ourselves. Let me pick up on that with you, Mayor Crombie. You know, the suggestion is that he has a trust problem. But he goes before the microphones, he apologizes for the things that he's got wrong, and his numbers shoot right back up again. What I, makes you think you can chip away at that? Hmm. I think Doug Ford is a really good retail politician. He's very folksy. He'll look you in the eye. He'll know your wife and children's name. And he, he makes a connection with people. I think that's what people like about him. Hmm. I like to think I, like, I can do that as well. I'm going to ask Ontarians, is their life more affordable today than it was before Doug Ford? Do they have trust and confidence in Doug Ford to lead them in, an, in another election. I'd like to say that people of Mississauga trust me. I've been elected three times, each time with increasing popular support. The last time was 78% of the vote. I think I have the leadership and the experience and the name recognition across the province that people trust. Um, and I'm going to try and take that to the bank. Ted Chu. I, so you have to be careful, uh, Bonnie, when you say increasing support from people, because the two times, last two times you've run for re-election, voter turnout has gone down by a quarter, and in the last election, four out of few, five people voted with their feet and didn't vote. So we've got to work, we all have, I'm not saying just you, Bonnie, but we all have a <clears throat> turnout problem. Uh, and it's got to be about motivating voters, not winning a, a high percentage of an increasingly small percentage of people who bother to vote. I'll say that there's a spark back. Liberals are back. People are interested in learning about us. When we go across the province, people are really interested in listening to what we have to say. And we have reinvigorated our brand. People are coming out. They're, they're building back confidence. We are building back confidence with our voters. And we're all proud to say we're liberal again. So I, I think you're right, Ted. I referenced this in my opening remarks. There's a general apathy about voting and we need to motivate Canadians generally here in Ontario, Ontarians right across the province to get out and vote because it's meaningful. Otherwise the result you will get is Doug Ford. So you need to come out and vote. Let me ask but the two federal guys about this because you two are both <clears throat> Liberal members of Parliament federally where the Liberal brand is not good at all right now. Do you think people make the distinction, Nate, let me start with you Nate, uh, do people make the distinction between who's a federal Liberal and a provincial Liberal? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's harder when you don't have a provincial leader, obviously. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the by-election in Kanata Carleton, and you had a formal, former federal MP in Karen McCrimmon who won a riding that no one saw us winning, that hasn't ever been liberal before provincially, mm -hmm. and she was able to carry us to victory. Mm -hmm. So if you have really strong local advocates who have their own authenticity, who have their own trust, it goes a very long way. And if we have a leader who's going to deliver that same integrity, honesty, and authenticity, then we're going to set ourselves up to win. Not only by drawing sharp contrasts and litigating the case against Ford. There's no competency on building housing. There's no competence in delivering a strong health care system. There's obviously no fairness for workers, whether it's education workers, people on ODSP. 
You look at the Greenbelt scandal, there's, there's no integrity, there's no corruption. It's his greatest weakness for sure. But we have to have a leader who's going to embody those values in a serious way and give people a positive reason. There are three not Doug Ford parties in the province of Ontario. We have to give people a positive reason to vote for us. Yes, sir, Nekvi. People do make a distinction between issues. They know that when it comes to health care and education, these are provincial responsibilities, and they know that Doug Ford has failed them um, in, in delivering good public health and a, and a good public education um, system. And they are looking for Ontario Liberal Party to elect a leader who does not share the same political instincts, political style, or political friends of Doug Ford. A leader that stands on their own and is relatable to people. You know, when I tell people my story, somebody who came at age 15 uh, to Canada some 35 years ago, hardly spoke any English, worked in a, in a motel along with my parents, cleaned rooms, washed bathrooms, made beds while going to school, slept on the floor of our, of our living room and had been able to build a very successful life. People see themselves reflected. These are the challenges that people are living through and we need to elect a leader, somebody like myself, who has had that experiences and can, can work on issues that makes their lives better uh, and, and their children's lives better. Let me pick up on something Nate just said, which that he, you said the green belt is the worst scandal during the course of this government's five plus years in office. And let's have a, a bit of a discussion about that right now. And I guess I gotta do this every time we talk about <laughs> development issues, is that I got a brother who's a home builder in the Hamilton area, and he's got some land that, that is in the green belt and wasn't in the green belt and now back is, is back in the green belt. So I put all that out there in the interest of full disclosure. Here's what I wanna know. Did the boundaries of the Green Belt, as they're currently constituted, come down from Mount Sinai? Or can you imagine circumstances in a future liberal government where you could see some land swaps, some adding here, some subtracting here? Let's discuss. Okay, you have to deal with this in your life as a mayor. What's I your view on this? I do have to deal with it. I think we've all been unequivocal about protecting the land that is in the that is in the green belt today. Um, and I will say that what we will see is that there's a huge connection with this government, not only the land in the green belt, which I would put into a, a trust or a foundation to take the politics out of it, but what we will see, and this speaks to the corruption that my, my friends have spoken to, that there'll be a connection with the urban boundaries. There'll be a connection with the 413, and there will be a connection with the ministerial zoning orders that all the same people have benefited. So we've all tried to articulate what makes us different. And the fact is, liberals care about people. And we care about marginalized and vulnerable people. Well, can you change we the boundaries? We don't care. Is it, allow is it no. acceptable to change the boundaries? It is not belt? acceptable to change the boundaries. They'll be held in a trust or into a foundation, no. uh, out of political hands, and they will be protected. Okay. Ted Chu, what's your view on this? Yeah, I, I think we should not be changing the boundaries of the Green at Belt. All. The Gre at all. The Green Belt is young. And so our society, our culture, doesn't have this idea that the Green Belt should be for the long term and permanent. So we've got to get that into our culture, and the way to do that is to not change the boundaries. I have another idea for how to protect the Green Belt, because right now, the government of the day can pass legislation to change the Green Belt. But if we did something like had a single province uh, constitutional amendment, so if we got the House of Commons and the Senate to agree to protect the Green Belt, it would make it uh, more difficult to change the Green Belt. Do you know if there's any appetite federally to do that? I don't know, but we need to find a way so that the uh, government just can't come in and have a majority and do whatever it wants and undo uh, something like the Green Belt. If this the, is what this current government has tried to do. Well, this current government also passed the legislation that protected the Green Belt better than it's ever been protected before. Would you give them that? Uh, after, after being yes. embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Only under duress. They might have been shamed into it. Okay, that's fair enough. Nate Erskine-Smith. Uh, so I'd say a few different things because it, first it is about trust in protecting the Green Belt and the environment. And I'm, I'm glad Mayor Crombie is unequivocal today. I think there was a challenge at the outset when she had said she was open to land swaps and there was rightfully pushback. And we're all united now in saying that we are there to protect the green belt. Now, it's connected obviously though to a housing issue. Why was there any momentum at all for Doug Ford to build on the green belt? Because people are, are <laughs> crying for getting housing built and housing affordability. Now, if you look at the housing affordability task force recommendations though, they say we can do both. They say we can protect the green belt as it is, and we should, and also build the housing we need if we build housing in the right way. And that's gentle density everywhere and greater density near transit. Now Ford, not only didn't follow those recommendations, but he used the cover of a real housing crisis to distract and to benefit his friends. And that's the corruption, that's the lack of integrity, and that's what he's gonna wear in the next election. You haven't spoken on this yet. What's your take? So, 
liberals created the green belt. We were ahead of time before anybody was really talking about nature-based solutions, but it has proven through time. And remember, I come from Ottawa. We have a green belt around Ottawa as well. It was built on that success to create world's largest green belt. So yes, the green belt has to be protected, but we need to go a step further now. We need to protect our ag prime agricultural land, which has been depleted at a rate uh, that should be alarming to everyone. Because once you take away farmland to build house or housing or warehouse, you cannot renew it anymore. So I'm suggesting, and I think all of us in different forms agree to this, that we need to create a farm belt where we protect our prime agricultural land so that we can continue to grow our own food. These are important steps, uh, uh, Steve, that, that any provincial government should be taking, not only from a climate change perspective, but also from a proper planning perspective and from a perspective of food security. You, uh, you, you, you for do know that we do record these programs and that we are able to play these musings back down the road. You've done that in the past. Right. <laughs> so you, you are all unequivocally on the record that if one of you becomes Premier of Ontario, there will be no land swaps, there will be no changes to the boundary of the Green Belt to make it smaller, maybe to make it bigger, but not to make it smaller. Let me just add that the mayors across Ontario, and as you know, I used to be chair of the big city mayors, we told the Premier directly, we did not need to open up the green belt. I know what he likes to encourage, I like to call it tall or sprawl, and certainly that would have been sprawl. In, in no universe would there have been newcomers to Canada living in houses in the green belt within two years. There would not have been. It was a false premise. There is no servicing. There are no roads. There is no infrastructure. There are no schools or pipes or uh, paramedic stations uh, or community centers, and there are no jobs. You need to put the people where the jobs are, where the infrastructure is, and the public transit is. And, and Steve, the reason I can say that is because <clears throat> we have to grow our province in every part and every region of this province, just not the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, not just the greater Ottawa area. We need to make sure that we're growing places like Owen Sound and Sarnia and Peterborough and Belleville and Cornwall and Sault Ste. Marie and Timmins. The list goes on. There's more to our province than the large urban centers and provincial government can play a really important role in enhan enhancing connectivity by way of public transit, by way of roads where public transit is now viable, and also good broadband, good internet, so that as we, uh, as a province, are growing by virtue of our population, people are living in all parts of the province, and that will result in a more prosperous Ontario. I okay. will change the boundaries, by the way. I will expand them. You would okay. expand the boundaries. You okay. may need to incentivize people to move to some of the more remote or northern communities, though, and that's something we need to think about as well, how we get people to some of those communities, because obviously they all want to come into the large urban areas where the jobs are. I, at the risk of raising an issue that might be a little bit inside baseball, but it's kind of extraordinary, so I do want to discuss it. And you two know what I'm about to go to. I've covered 20 leadership conventions over the years, and I have never seen, two weeks before voting day, two candidates come forward publicly and say, "If you, you should vote for me on the first ballot, but if I'm not around, you can vote for him on the second ballot, or vice versa. And that is the, I guess, unofficial alliance. Well, I guess it's official. This is the official alliance that Nader Smith and Yasser Nakvi have publicly proclaimed, which is interesting. So I want to talk about it a little bit. How did this happen? Well, we've been on the road for a very long time. And I've said the entire leadership race that I care about the direction of our party. It's about beating Doug Ford. It's also about the direction we set for our party. And I've been on stage with Yasser where he said he wants principal leadership that challenges the status quo. I have worked to live that for eight years as a member of parliament. The relentless hustle that we both share of rebuilding in every corner of the province in every 124 ridings. There's a lot of a shared approach. And we looked at it and we said, you know, it's, it's not that abnormal. I, in a nomination 10 years ago, there were six of us on the ballot and three of us worked together collaboratively on the ranked ballot. Because it's not multiple rounds of voting, mm -hmm. it's one round of voting and we have to let people know in advance. There's no convention floor for delegates to walk over anywhere. We gotta let them know who we're endorsing on the second ballot. And so that's what this was about. It was about a mutual endorsement that if I'm unsuccessful winning and we're working hard to win this thing, no question, we're ready to win. But if it's not us, then I'm very happy to be working together with Yasser. Did you approach him? It's been an ongoing conversation. We, ongoing. we were at the Laurier Liberal Ladies Luncheon in Niagara, and we were answering each other's sentences effectively. Like there's, there's been a, just a mutual trust that we've built over time. It wasn't there at the beginning, but it's certainly there now. You saw the comments, no doubt, uh, in the paper the other day where Dwight Duncan, the former finance minister, said, 
He doesn't like this arrangement at all, and as a result, he's going to give Ted Shu his second ballot support instead of you. Are you worried that this thing will have the exact opposite effect you wanted it to have? Well, we, we've been very transparent uh, in, in, in what we think is the, the direction of the party is uh, in making sure uh, that we're collaborating, which people expect of their politicians. Look, Steve, I got into this race with a very stated mission, which is to defeat Doug Ford in 2026. And I've been saying from, from the beginning that the manner in which we do that is by rebuilding, transforming our party in every part of the province, in every region, so we're competitive in the next election, by, by bringing ethics and accountability back at Queen's Park, uh, Queen's Park because it's sorely lacking under Doug Ford, and by championing uh, practical <laughs> liberal solutions uh, to make Ontarians' life easier to, to live. And that's where I found a common cause uh, in, in aid in terms of the hustle he's put in, in terms of the ideas that we have, uh, we have uh, put forward. And we've been transparent and, and, uh, and quite uh, in dem dem demonstrating our, our collaboration in making that happen. It's in the end of the day, uh, the decision of the, the Ontario Liberal uh, members to make. I'm asking them to trust me with their first vote. They're asking me who they should be ranking to because it is a ranked ballot. Yeah. And nobody's winning this on the first ballot. Uh, the interesting thing about this leadership race is, and so ranked ballot will matter, and this will allow for a better decision to come out. I'm, I'm going to come back to that. Nobody's going to win this on the first ballot because I, I want to know if everybody agrees with that. But first of all, why are you not part of this? Well, I was uh, invited to in an early stage, and I, I declined. Um, I want to be for something as opposed to uh, collaborating to be uh, not for some, a particular candidate. Do you think they're collaborating to be against something? Well, I think they're collaborating to be against the other candidates to try to uh, get over the hump, so to speak, in a later round of counting. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a legitimate uh, strategy. Imagine but, that, cooperating but, uh, to win. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened Surely in the that's last, what we want in our politics. It took several years for the Liberal Party in a series of uh, debates and uh, conventions to agree to this uh, one member, one vote system where every voter <clears throat> has the chance to rank candidates, not just the ones who can afford to pay the money to go to the convention and pay for the hotels and everything. Um, and so I think the voters should be taking advantage of this ability to scrutinize uh, all of the candidates and rank them in order. It's also very important because there's three years until the next election. Whoever becomes the leader of this party is gonna undergo a lot of scrutiny. So the more scrutiny we can uh, apply right now from the 100,000 or so uh, members, uh, the, the benefit will, will go to the leader who is eventually chosen by these uh, members who are carefully scrutinizing and carefully ranking the voters. Okay, I have heard this described as an ABC alliance, anybody but Crombie. The oh. suggestion is that these two have, been have decided to go public in their alliance because they're frankly, while they can complete each other's sentences, they're, they want to stop you because they perceive you as the front runner. How do you look at it? I think we have four great candidates in this race. We had five. Nadal Shamji has decided not to pursue. Any one of my colleagues here would make a better leader and a better premier than Doug Ford. And you know what? Ontarians, Liberals in Ontario, have for the very first time been given a vote. Every member, every single party member can vote. It's not a delegated convention. And people will decide for themselves, as Ted has suggested. They'll scrutinize all the candidates and make a decision. And I think the decision they will come to will be who can beat Doug Ford. That will be the ballot question on November 25th and November 26th, and that's where they'll put their X. But I'm going to tell you, they each bring an incredible set of skill set um, and uh, expertise and competence um, that I have confidence in all of them. Do you have a problem with this alliance? No, I have no problem. I have no problem. Because you kind of took a little shot at them in the paper the other day when no. you said, you know, oh, they're, they're two guys who knew each other well because they've spent a lot of time on the liberal backbenches in uh, Ottawa. They spent some time together on the road and in Ottawa. Okay. Have you seen any evidence that this is actually having the adverse consequence that you did not want to see rather than the positive influence that you hope to have? Well, I've seen certain talking heads describe it as a backroom deal, despite the fact we did a public press conference and publicly communicated For 45 it. minutes. Right, exactly. <laughs> I've, I've seen the comments that you referenced that this is an anyone but Crombie campaign. Of course not. 
This is about building something and who shares a vision of the direction that I want for the party. Why, why am I doing this in the first place? It is to make a difference through politics and to make sure that we defeat Doug Ford. And I think if we set the right direction for our party, we set ourselves up for success at the ballot box. And when I look at other candidates in this race, you know, I, I mentioned being on stage with the Astor and we share a principled approach, pr pragmatic approach, progressive approach to politics. On the other hand, and I'm glad Mayor Karambi's in this race. She brings a lot to this race. She also has described herself as wanting to govern from the right of center. That's not my that is not my politics. And that's not the politics that I think will defeat Doug Ford. Okay, what's, can I, all right, you want to add to that? What's sure. a good thing about this race is that it's competitive that we've got four really credible people running. We had a fifth candidate. I wish he was still part of this, uh, of this race as well. And, and the members of the party have a choice. We've got over 100,000 members, as you, as you mentioned. We're the largest political party in Ontario right now, probably a third or fourth largest in the country. And that is good for our party. It's good for the province of Ontario because that is the vetting process that we're all going through before our members will decide who will make the the best leader. Okay. Just before you move on, I just yeah. also want to say, we have four of us fighting to be leader, fighting to be premier. Yeah. You know, the NDP just went through a leadership race and only one person, only Merritt stepped forward and they kind of said, oh, okay, Merritt, over to you. No one else wants it. We have four people at this table they with you, Steve, that are fighting for it. They enough. didn't scrutinize her. There you go. Well, so here and, we are. That's what we need and to you know, at the end of the day, the, the Ontario Liberal voters will decide. Yeah, that's where we all agree. This is competitive race. No one wins on the first ballot, and it's up to the members. Well, I don't know okay. if I disagree. That'll always depend on turnout. Uh, let's, let's follow that up. This is now twice I've heard. No one's going to win this on the first ballot. And again, <clears throat> if you judge by how much money has been raised, if you judge by how much the campaigns have said, we've signed up this many numbers, if you judge by endorsements, she's way ahead. Yeah. Now, is she ahead enough to win on the first... Are you ahead enough to win on the first ballot? Depends on who votes. If we get our voters out, yes. It's not even close, though. Dollars don't vote, okay? So if you compare donations as an example, you've got more total dollars for sure. But if you look at grassroots donors, then, then we're leading. Oh, and I don't know that I agree with you there either. I have more than 2,000 donors. And on the grassroots donors of under $200, the people who are members of the party who have contributed and are going to participate in this race... I'm very confident that we are in the lead and at a minimum competitive. And so no one's walking away with this based on earning dollars from people who aren't even voting in this race. And when you look at endorsements, endorsements count for one vote. This is not a, a delegated convention where there are super voters and mm -hmm. MPs and MPPs have an ex outsized say. This is individual members that have an equal voice to me, an equal voice to anyone here, and, and that's what's going to matter. And it's that grassroots politics, that ability to renew our grassroots, that's what's ultimately going to matter. When you look at the member, membership numbers and you look at the IDs that are coming in, I think it's very clear. It's zero percent chance that someone wins on the first ballot. It's just a question of what the margin is between us. Steve, everybody knows that I, I love to canvass. I love knocking on doors, and I'm actually doing this in this leadership. I've been to every four part of uh, corners of this province in writings, in writings where a liberal has not shown up in 20 or 30 years at somebody's door. And people are telling me this. Nobody's talking about endorsements. Nobody's talking about dollars raised. People are talking about how, what, what are your thoughts on public health care system? How are you yeah. going to make sure that the emergency room in Midland, the hospital in Midland is going to open again? How are you going to recruit more family doctors in, in Timmins so that people can have services? How are you going to build more housing so international students are not sleeping under the bridge? These are the type of issues that people are talking about. And these are the questions they're asking, I believe, all, of all four of us mm -hmm. to ensure that they do elect a leader who is different than Doug Ford, who is, can stand up to Doug Ford, who can prosecute Doug Ford on his ethical breaches and not get stuck in the, the same line of questioning as he is. Ted Chu, I know every leadership contest is different, but I do remember, and I'm trying to remember when, when was the last one? It was 2020. I remember lots of people coming up to me saying, oh, this thing's way more competitive than you think, and Stephen Del Duca won it on the first ballot. Mm -hmm. So now everybody here said, well, not everybody, three of you are saying <laughs> this is for sure going to go two ballots. How do you know? I've had a uh, quite a bump, I would say, in uh, IDs and in donations in the last couple of weeks. Uh, when I go door knocking, and I've been going door knocking in uh, strategic places, uh, Grimsby, Dundas, and the shore of uh, St. Lawrence River, um, I'm finding a lot of undecided voters. I'm finding a lot of supporters of mine. I'm finding that I'm able to convert them yeah. by talking to them. Yeah. And some of them, I'm 
have to say, yeah, there are a lot of Bani supporters, but I've actually converted a lot of your supporters by, by talking it's to them It's a competitive race. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so you might think that when somebody answers the phone and pushes the button and says they support somebody, the support is actually not that deep. It's fluid. It's fluid. There's a lot of undecided people out there. Uh, my, Campaigns matter. The, the canvassers that I have, uh, the riding leads that I have say, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there still. So our phone calls matter, our, our door-to-door uh, campaigns uh, matter, and it's still very fluid. There's 100,000 plus people who've signed up to vote in this thing. Now, we know they all won't. In fact, if you're lucky, maybe half will. So of that 50,000, how many are you going to get on the first ballot? Well, of course, I hope I get 50% plus one, but you never know. I'm doing the same thing the guys are doing. We're all, all of us are going door to door and canvassing and getting a great result. When I knock on a door, I get the response, it's the mayor of Mississauga doing at my door. So I have a lot of name recognition. And at the end of the day, I think some, I think our voters want someone who can go head to head with Doug Ford. They want someone who has gone head to head with Doug Ford. And I would argue that I am that person. And people have seen me in action with Doug Ford. And at the end of the day, we want to win because we want to get rid of this scandal-plagued, corrupt government and bring back an honest, ethical, transparent government that cares more about people than rich friends and donors. Let me invite you to, because I know you've said in the past, we need somebody who was very, very different from Doug Ford in order to be able to make the case to the people of Ontario. Yes. And, and you have been specific about the fact that you don't think Mayor Crombie is different enough because she has taken money from developers for her campaign. Do you think that that is like disqualifying for her becoming leader of the party? No, I've never said it's disqualifying. I say that it is going to be a political challenge where you can't bring the full force of an argument. If the NDP is going to say, well, you're subject to the same criticisms, the Green Party is going to say you're subject to the same criticisms. But take that question of winnability because, you know, donations from developers, that's, that's part of the picture. Different comments about governing from the right of center and blocking housing and embracing gentle density saying, I'm not going to use the strong mayor powers, now I'm using them. You run down a list, and, and, and I'm glad on most occasions, Mayor Crombie's in a place now where she's embracing gentle density. She said, the green belt's sacred, and said, no, it's centrist, not right of center. But the real question is, when you look at Ontario in particular, and the strength of the NDP in Ontario, and you look at the polling, we're, we're neck and neck with the NDP. If you're going to defeat Doug Ford, you don't, it's not enough to earn a few conservative voters who are mad about the lack of integrity, who are mad about the corruption, mad about the green belt. You've got to earn the trust of progressive voters in this province. And the question that I would ask is, how are you going to earn the trust of progressive voters? Like, I think I am a progressive voter. I've seen polling. And if I were the leader today, we come within five seats of Doug Ford. So I know I'm uh, very competitive, and I look forward to the race. Um, but are you going to answer it based follow, on polling? I like, if I'm a progressive all, voter, is polling enough? I think we all enough? follow the rules to the T with respect to uh, donations. Liberals are the are, is the party that uh, changed the rules for donations, and we eliminated corporate donations and union donations, etc. We take donations from individuals. Let's be very clear. We are not disqualifying professions or what's next that we will disqualify. Every single person at this table has taken donations from home builders. Not bundled and donations, though. Bundled Not bundled donations. donations. Uh, the only person who bundles anything I have is Rogers, because it's my cable bill and my there phone There were nine bill. employees at one <laughs> development corporation who donated the max each over $30,000 when they had business before the mayor's council. Thanks, now, I know it's a unanimous matter, but like that, that let's be honest, we're in politics. That's, Nate, that's a Nate, political liability. Nate, Nate, those are the same people that donated to my campaigns as mayor. They are partners in home building. And the matter before the council was decided by the staff. We all voted in favor of the staff recommendation, which actually strengthened um, what had been recommended previously and that brought us increased parkland. You don't think and the pedestrian. Challenge? No, there is none. I don't know who donates when. I have a Cracker at Jack the team that are bringing in donations. At the time of those donations, it was 15% of the total donor. Anyway, well, we, don't have to, we don't have to dwell just on Just a minute, yeah. I, I want to respond to that because certainly my percentage of overall donations from home builders is probably in the realm of 4 or 5%. But if you want to analyze everyone else's, we can because they're a lot higher given to the, the sum total of my donations. You so there is an issue about p political vulnerability of Mayor Crombie. You know, when you look at her, the political instincts of, of uh, doing land swaps on Greenbelt uh, and First Blush, that's a, vulner that's a <clears throat> vulnerability. When you talk about uh, a political uh, style that we will govern from right of center, 
that's a political vulnerability. When you talk about one in five donors similar to Doug Ford uh, and having same political friends, that's a vulnerability. And you know it that Doug Ford and the Conservative Party are going to exploit that in their favor. And that only helps the NDP. It's a three or four way race in Ontario and we have to be really mindful. And that's why I continue to make the argument that we need a leader of the Ontario Liberal Party that comes from the ranks of the party, who stands in stark contrast to Doug Ford, somebody who is trustworthy and is relatable uh, to Ontarians, like I have been in terms of my background and the work I have done, and not being part of the establishment, working three times harder than anybody else to accomplish everything in my life, whether <laughs> it's, it's, it's personally, president, professionally, <laughs> and politically. Yeah, and I have worked really, really hard to be able to get all those, those positions. It was, no, nothing was handed to me. I had to work day in and day out, and I'm very proud of that work, and that's the kind of, that's the kind of hard work Ontarians live through, and that's the kind of leader in, we in need fairness, for the we all work hard. In fairness, yeah. we all work hard okay. for what we've achieved. I've been a third-term mayor, I've been a councillor, and I've been a member of parliament yeah, as well. Every I single agree. one You've of us at this agree. table work very hard. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, can, we're all, we're all on the same page there. Yeah. Yeah. And every, I, I will say, uh, the, the number one feedback, in, in fairness, and we can have our disagreements, the number one feedback from members is saying, any single one of you would be great. We've never seen a race with the caliber of candidates that we've That's got. That's right. We've got I agree. So I like agree. That is the number one. Let feedback. me put this to Ted Chu, though, because it emerged in the legislature, I think, a week or two ago, that a couple of the big developers of the Greenbelt land in, I think, York region, maybe Halton as well, maybe Peel as well, I'm not sure, uh, actually gave money to the NDP as well. They, they seem give to give. To everyone. They, I was just going to say, they give money to everyone, which makes me ask whether this is going to be <laughs> as big an issue as some of you want to make it. Well, I, I asked um, John Garrettson, former uh, Attorney General, the guy who was around when they created the, the Green Belt, and he ran for leadership in the 1990s. He's a and former MPP for Kingston. Former the Islands. MPP for Kingston the Islands, and he said, you know, Ted, don't worry about the, the difference in donation amounts because the, the folks from the big cities they can raise a lot of money. Uh, you're from a smaller city, you're not going to be able to raise as much money. Don't worry about that. It's about getting votes. It's about, it's about motivating liberals to want to vote for you and meeting people and introducing yourself. So I'm not that worried about the, uh, the uh, ability of somebody from a smaller city to, to raise money. When I become the leader, I'll try to raise money from across Ontario. The fraction of the donors that I uh, am getting from outside of eastern Ontario is growing every week. And it, we had a big bump in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm not that worried if, if I don't have access to the big donors that the big city candidates okay. do. Steve, at the end of the day, we have to fight in an election campaign. We have <laughs> to have a leader who has an ability to raise money. That is the reality, or we won't win. We're being out fundraised 10 to 1. We do need someone who steps forward who can raise money for us, because all ridings matter, not just strategic ridings. All of them do, and we can't support all the ridings if we don't build a big war chest. Okay, let's talk a little policy here, because if one of you becomes premier, you are going to find out that you're spending $80 billion. It will no doubt be more by the time you become premier. $80 billion a year on health care and $35 billion a year on education. Massive amounts <laughs> of money. And I'd like to go around to the four of you now, and I want to hear one idea. We're going to keep it simple. I want to hear one idea on health care that would distinguish your approach from the approach of the current government? Yes or Nakfi, start us off. So, so the one I idea that I am absolutely committed and passionate about is how do we recruit more doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers? We have incredible talent that's coming into our province from different parts of the world, people who are doctors or nurses or psychologists and psychiatrists, but we don't allow them to practice here. We don't license them to practice How would you there. change that? Work with the regulatory colleges. If they don't come along, then you lose the use the legislative powers that we have. I've got to tell you, but, I've been hearing that for 30 years. Well, mark my word, Steve, this is something we will get it done under my leadership. It's personal to me. Both my parents were lawyers when we came to, <coughs> to Ontario 35 years ago, and, and they were not able to practice for a single day. They had to run a motel. I mean, what's talk about soul crushing for for them. I mean, they the entire life and Little has changed. There is a path forward. You can create a defined pathway for uh, our professionals. Provinces like Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador are doing a better job than Ontario. There are about 4,000 doctors in Ontario right now that are either driving Ubers or working in a lab. I will make sure that they're practicing medicine in northern Ontario, in rural Ontario, and other parts of the province. Ted Chu, one idea on health care. I'm for uh, team-based primary care and geographic health homes. 
team-based because we can get our uh, physicians and nurse practitioners to spend more time taking care of, of patients uh, and less time on, on administration, and data processing. And geographic health homes, that's making sure that everybody has access to uh, primary care. Gotcha. Nate Orson Smith, one so, idea on health care. So I, I agree with access to family health teams and the need to address the huge gap in access to primary care and family doctors overall. But I would emphasize where there's a, a very clear difference and, and we're going to have ambition where they've completely failed is around mental health and addictions. Mm -hmm. You've got a, a Ford government that has fought against evidence-based harm reduction. You've got a government that is underinvested in on-demand treatment, and that's what we need to get people the help that they need when they need it. And lastly, a government that doesn't take homelessness seriously. You see encampments in every community across this province. You've got municipalities that are screaming for provincial leadership. And if we deliver a public health approach, if we deliver a public health approach grounded in evidence-based harm reduction, treatment options, and housing, we will not only save lives, we will also protect public safety by delivering public health. One approach to healthcare yeah. that would distinguish you from the current government. Well, I think we're all on the same page. More community-based healthcare, wraparound care, as Nate has talked about, a team-based approach that Ted has talked about. Not only foreign-trained doctors, but more domestically trained doctors. So that would mean more residency spaces. It would mean another medical school, at least one more, particularly in the north, um, that would include more uh, French language training. And I would tie um, a multi-year service uh, agreement to free tuition. We would offer free tuition if um, young, young, new young doctors would settle in communities for an extended period of time. In underserved communities. In underserved communities. And, and also, let's, let's bring in more virtual and online um, appointments with doctors so that you can service some of those remote and underserved areas, virtual appointments. Okay. That's health care. Let's talk education. Again, the, one of the huge numbers in the budget. Nate Erskine-Smith? One idea on education that would distinguish you from the current government. They are massively underinvesting in special education assistance. And you hear this concern in every community you're in, and some are more underserved than others. But across the board, we are not giving our kids the best chance to succeed if we underinvest inside the classroom. We talk about caps, capping class sizes, but it really is about a real investment in special education assistance. Ted Chu. You know, it's amazing. We got to this point where teachers are saying that uh, classes are being disrupted, kids are swearing at teachers, hitting teachers. Uh, I've never heard that before in classrooms. Uh, I have said in my policy uh, on my website, I will spend more money on education, like this extra new money. I think we need to reduce class sizes, increase the number of educational assistants in classes. So. Uh, I think just the idea that you have to invest more to get, make sure we have the proper education. And this is going to matter for, for decades and decades in the future. We're still suffering from the damage caused by the pandemic. One quick follow-up here. I, I've had numerous experts in this studio over the years, and I've asked them, if you had a billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket, would you spend it on reducing class sizes? And none of them would. They say it's kind of... It, it, it's, it's a shiny bauble in the window that parents love, but in terms of outcomes, it actually... Mm -hmm is not money well spent. Do you still want that as a priority on your list? I think that when you have teachers saying, I have 33 kids or something like that, there's, there's definite, uh, the teachers keep saying, I can't take care of my kids because the class size is too big. And I'm sure you can target it. I think there are uh, areas where, dis schools in disadvantaged areas where you can get a bigger bang uh, for the buck in terms of uh, more people in schools. If, if you're, uh, if you're in danger of physical violence from kids, I think you need help in the classroom. Bonnie Crombie, a new idea on education. Well, we need to train our kids for success and train them for the jobs and skills of tomorrow. And we do need peace with the teachers' unions, the educator unions, and there hasn't been peace and stability in a very long time. Uh, we would need to repeal Bill 124 so our educators and our nurses can be paid a fair wage. I would say we need to recruit more teachers in the system, and that is so we can uh, reduce the number of kids in our classrooms. Um, what else? I would get rid of the uh, EQAO uh, as well. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think it stresses out kids, and teachers end up teaching uh, for the exam, and this it's is not the test worthwhile. That the testing, three yeah. sixes and yeah, nines yeah, taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to reinvest in our schools. There's a 15-year backlog and a 15 billion dollar shortage um, in building back that infrastructure. 
So there's a, a number of things we can do, not only revise the curriculum, recruit more doctors, re decrease classroom sizes, um, and focus on our kids. Let's bring peace and stability back to the classroom and put the respect back. Yes, Sir Nekvi. So I've got two kids in the system. Um, How old are your kids? My son Rafi is 11, my daughter Ellie is uh, seven, grade six and, and two. They both go to a, a, a French public school in, in Ottawa. I talk to parents a couple of times a week when I'm picking and dropping the kids. The number of parents are looking at private schools as an option and have lost their faith on a public education system is extremely concerning. I'm sitting in front of you, Steve, as a product of a public education system. A kid who at age 15 could barely speak English mm -hmm. was taken by incredible teachers and given all kinds of support. We need to restore that confidence, that faith in a public education system, and smaller classrooms will allow to do that so that our teachers can spend more time. The Ford government did one good thing. They did de-streaming. That was the right thing to do but it also comes with appropriate supports. And one, one of them is to have smaller classes from K to 12 so that, so that teachers can spend the appropriate time and the resources on those individual children based on their needs. That has been lacking in the system today, which is resulting in hardworking middle-class parents saving 15, 20, $25,000 a year per child and sending kids to, to private schools. Talk about an affordability crisis getting hmm. exa exasperated as a result of it. I want to turn all that into our system. Can I just, yeah, let's leave this wide shot up here because I want to find out. Kathleen Wynne, when she was Premier of Ontario, had an idea about giving free post-secondary tuition to some eligible students, you know, uh, those who couldn't afford to go, those who were motivated but unable to afford to go and so on. Um, brought it in and it got cancelled. Get the grade and you will go. Yeah. Would any of you bring that back if you're a Premier of Ontario? It's in my platform. It's and in your I, platform? And talk about $90,000 or less. Okay. Ted Chu? I think it's really important to catch students in the last year of high school uh, before, because that, it will make a big difference if you can guarantee them in the last year of high school. You're not going to have to worry about the cost of, of university. And e even, it starts even with application fees. Uh, that is a barrier for some kids in, in high school for doing some sort of post-secondary education. What so are the, I, would, I, I have to admit my kids are a little beyond application <laughs> fees for university now, but is, is it 100 bucks per university or per post-secondary institution to apply nowadays? It's up there, I know. It's up there. Mine are beyond, too. Okay. So I'm a ways away from that. I've got a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Uh, my parents were public school teachers, but, but not at the university level. And so, you know, I think you've got to think of education in two ways. One, you've got to have world-class public education in primary and secondary. And then when you think about post-secondary, because we have high-quality post-secondary education here in Ontario, but cost should never be a barrier to young people accessing that education. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know that it'll be a, exactly the way that it was proposed initially, but we've said for low-income families, there should be free tuition, so the cost is never a barrier. Mm -hmm. For middle-income families, you're looking at increasing grants, but it's not going to be cost-free. Okay. I would look at it as well, but I understand the uptake wasn't very high with it. I, of course, I'd want all marginalized kids, mm -hmm. give them the opportunity to go to post-secondary um, if they so sh should so choose to. But I know that when it was part of the platform with the Wynn government, the uptake wasn't very great. I think it's because th they said that, uh, first of all, a lot of them didn't know about it. And second, oh, that could be it. And the other thing I kept hearing was mm -hmm. a lot of kids by grade 12 have given up yeah. on the you possibility of sooner. even going. Yeah. So that's why there wasn't much uptake. They just didn't see it as a possibility for them, and therefore, which is really sad if you think yeah. about it. Anyway, yeah. and it perpetuates, help that. And it perpetuates the cycle of poverty. Yeah, right. Children who come from families who do not have higher education tend to think that's just not even an option available. Mm -hmm. And by bringing that policy, we were starting to see higher participation rates in that that demographic: single mothers. Uh, kids with no parents with no education, racialized background, starting to say, ah, perhaps I can go to college or university. Mm -hmm. Okay, this has been a, a lovely, ethereal, intelligent <laughs> conversation, and I want to bring it right down into the gutter now because we're going to talk some brass knuckles politics in our <coughs> remaining six or seven minutes here. I want to know what you're all going to do if you don't win. And I know you all say you're going to win. Okay, fine. But I want to know if, like, are you really going to run provincially next time if you don't win this thing? I served 11 years as a member of provincial That's parliament. That's why I'm asking. Why would you want to do it again? You've been well, there, done that. But because I'm I'm running because I think Ontario could it could be a better place to live other than Doug Ford and Ontario <laughs> Liberal Party is 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 the party 
to to make it better. But, uh, but you're an MP now. Why, if you're an MP now, why would you want to leave being an MP and come back to Queen's Park, something you've already done? Because my mission is to defeat Doug Ford in 2026. Okay. Ted Chu, how about you? On Monday, December the 4th, I have the member statement. Uh, <laughs> you're, the one person, the you're the one person here who's got a seat. I'm the only one with a seat, and I'm going to be using that. So, because leadership starts uh, the day after the announcement on mm -hmm. December the 2nd. And uh, one of the things that I can do is have be a leader in the legislature and push back against Doug Ford. People who are hurting, they can't pay the rent next month, they lost their family doctor, mm. they want somebody advocating for them right away, pushing back against the Ford government. When they turn on the television, they want to see the liberal leader pushing back, asking a hard question of Doug Ford in the, in the legislature. So I can start the day after. I'm going to run again in 2026. That's what I was going to get to. I'm so going to run again in 2026. Even if you don't win the leadership, you're, Absolutely. you're for sure back in 2026. Absolutely. Okay. We're not in power right now. We have a multi-year plan. So I'm, I'm part of that, no matter what. Okay. You've got a pretty good job right now. Well, you're on leave from a pretty good job right now. Unpaid as, leave. Unpaid leave as mayor of Mississauga. But if you don't win the Ontario Liberal leadership, are you running as an MPP in the next election anyway? Yes. In June 2026. I've made that commitment. So you're for sure, this is your last term as mayor of Mississauga. That's correct. Either way. That's correct. Okay. But you expect to have these three guys in your cabinet, I presume. Well, that would be my hope. <laughs> okay, so we have you on record about that as well. Now, you're a current member of parliament. You're yeah. not running again for an MP, is that right? I won't run again federally regardless, yeah. Okay. Now, you're in a somewhat complicated situation in as much as your federal seat provincially is actually one of the very few held by the Liberals already. By a great MPP and Mary Margaret McMahon. Right, yeah. and my hunch is you're not going to tell her to move out of the seat that she won so that you could run there. I worked very hard to get her elected. I want her to stay there. Okay, so if... If you are not the leader of this party after December 2nd, are you still promising that you will run provincially in the next provincial election? So I'm told that the right political answer is to say yes, but the honest answer <laughs> is it depends. Because in the end, I'm in this race to make the biggest difference that I can. Mm -hmm. I've, I've said repeatedly I care about strong, more independent local representation. I've, I, it's been a great honor. I represent Beaches East York, the riding that I grew up in, where I was raised by two public school teachers, where I went to school, where all, my, my, my whole life is there. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not going to be able to represent that community, it's really going to depend upon the difference that I'm able to make with a more senior role, whether it's around the cabinet table, whether it is, you know, involved in helping to run the campaign. And so, you know, it really will come down to what role is there for me to but make if, that difference. I got it. But if you win the leadership, clearly you're going to find another seat besides Beaches sure. East York. Sure, of course. But if, I, if I'm not the leader and I don't know what that role is, if I'm going to be an individual member of provincial parliament and there's not a natural riding for me to run in, well, then it depends on the role that I'm going to be able to play and the difference that I'm going to be mm -hmm. able to make. Okay, we have four minutes left here, and this is where I need all of you to be really economical in your answers because we can't <laughs> go over. <laughs> You've all been to all corners, nooks, crannies, big cities, little hamlets in this province over the last many months. And I just want to find out from each of you, 40 seconds to each of you, tell me something neat you learned about Ontario you didn't know before. Ted Shu. When I went to Hearst, I saw the pile of logs. Uh, <laughs> and it was, uh, I saw the pile, and then somebody told me the actual pile, you're only seeing the front of it, it's, it's uh, 10 times bigger than that. It's like three stories high. Uh, and then, and then there's two other mills like that in the in the area. So you've got to go up north uh, to see some of these things, like the the piles of logs at the at the mills. And to get to Hearst, you go to Timmins. You and go keep to, going. And keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Anyway. Okay, Bonnie Crombie. Well, I've just learned again how beautiful our province is as I've been touring around and. You know, there are Hallmark movies being made in Almont and, and Godrich and Kincardine and how beautiful, but the North is what really attracted me. I fell in love with Espanola and Elliott Lake and Cochran's and yes, Timmins and Hearst and um, just so many. Oh, Fort Francis I loved. I couldn't believe the number of lakes up in Kenora. Different time zone. Different time zone. So zones. far away, That's it's okay. a different time zone. And my favorite story was driving between Sault Ste. Marie and Timmins and having to stop in Chapleau. We stopped on the side of the road, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we got stuck. And my team said, don't worry, the next truck that goes by will pull us out. They'll have ropes. And I 
I said, but it's not even winter. Imagine if this was ice and snow. It was only soft earth. Sure hmm. enough, a truck, and within minutes, a truck went by and we waved them down. They pulled us out and I said, it really works. They shouldn't have to do that. We, we need to pave those roads and expand those roads. And that's something I learned as well. But in Chapleau, one of my favorite stops, we stopped, a, it's a, the Chapleau hub is a pub at night and a cafe in the afternoon. And we walked in as a rest stop and the owner looked up and she was wiping a dish and she did a double take and said, what's the mayor of Mississauga doing in Chapleau? It's my favorite story. Nate Erskine Smith. Uh, so uh, my wife and I have been together for almost 20 years and married for 12 and she grew up on a farm in Lambton County. So I was pretty familiar with Southwestern Ontario. Growing up, we would travel to Sudbury and do the Big Nickel and do the Science North and eventually make our way to family in, on Manitoulin Island and Manitowning. But I, I, I gotta be honest, I hadn't been there for a very long time. I hadn't traveled Northern Ontario in quite the way that I've, I've traveled Northern Ontario. I've driven in January from Sioux Lookout down to Thunder Bay. And just the distance, just the accessibility challenges in Northern Ontario change the policy landscape entirely. And if you don't have an appreciation for that, you're not gonna be able to serve those communities. And even something as simple as, <coughs> you're driving on those highways and cell service disappears. And there's an accident, oh, yeah. that's a safety concern. Yeah. And so I it really it. does drive a view of how do you serve all of this province? Yes, so Ontario is big, beautiful, and diverse. It's even getting more diverse. So I think that's incredible. Think about it. I've lived in the Niagara region when we came to Canada. I've obviously I live in in Ottawa. Northern Ontario is really special. The UFO sighting in Moonbeam. Yeah, that was so amazing. <laughs> I mean, I gotta take my kids to Moonbeam, Ontario, so we can see the, that UFO again with the aliens inside. <laughs> that ship is there, isn't it? That yes. is there. People it don't is. believe it. You I go know, to Moonbeam, I know, Ontario. I, know. Okay, I got a picture this with is, it too. This is what my picture looked like. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Well, look, I, again, I want to finish as we started by saying I want to thank all of you for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight and helping uh, not only our general audience, but I imagine a lot of the 100,000 people who are potentially able to vote for all of you are watching this as well. So appreciate you and your staffs making time for us and being with us today. Bonnie Crombie, Nate Erskine-Smith, Ted Shue, Yasser Nakfi. There we go. Am I out of time? I'm not quite out of time. Glad that you're back, though. We were super happy for TVO to be back. Well, you know, you know, let the record show I didn't bring that up, but I'm glad you did. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah. we're very happy Much to be here. Wish it was a better yeah. deal for workers, though. I will say that. You know, <laughs> don't get me in trouble. <laughs> Just don't get me in trouble here, all right? Go. <laughs> Gosh, don't get me in trouble. Okay, that's it. Uh, she's got eight fingers left, which means I have eight seconds to say I'm Steve Pake, and thanks for watching, and so long. Until next time.